busy you are, sir. Uh, we've seen you at different times. Uh, for a quick background, Secretary Lopez is obviously the head of the Department of Trade and Industry, DTI. But he's also been in government before, presidential management staff, and then NADA before that. And of course, he was a top executive of a Philippine food and beverage company. He's been a strong advocate for entrepreneurship education for 12 years. And obviously, he also chairs the Board of Investments, the Intellectual Property Office, Small Business Corp Corporation, and the PESA Economic Zone. And he's received many awards, and he has a, has a bachelor's degree in economics from UP and a master's from Williams College in Massachusetts. He's a very distinguished guest. He's a great friend of all chambers. I'd like to give him a warm welcome. Just finally, uh, after the presentation and talk by Secretary Lopez, we will have a Q&A. Uh, it's highly likely we'll not be able to get through all the questions. Any other questions, Secretary Lopez has kindly said we'll send to his department and obviously we'll get feedback thereafter. Secretary Lopez, on behalf of all the six chambers, thank you very much for your time and we look forward to hearing from you and answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and to all the distinguished leaders of the various European chambers and Your Excellency Ambassador Jorge and other members of the diplomatic corps, to our dear friends, uh, European uh, friends, uh, in, in uh, the Philippines right now, the company is located here. And to all those uh, outside the Philippines currently, uh, I just wish you well and uh, the best of health. Uh, in this time of COVID pandemic, it certainly is a different uh, environment. And uh, we're all facing this uh, personally also as a, you know, for the first time having a face of pandemic and uh, right with uh, the position with, uh, with so many uh, I guess responsibilities the government has to take care of, but uh, we certainly would like to continue our dialogue, the friendship, and and our partnership in, in trade and investment, and in many uh, dimensions of the country. Uh, first and foremost, we thank the EU in general, and of course your respective countries, in particular, as you also assist our country in uh, going through this uh, the times of difficulties. All the support you're giving, uh, I guess, in from from the bottom of our heart, on behalf of our, our country, our president, we'd like to thank you. Uh, I have prepared a, a series of slides uh, that, uh, if you will allow me, I just like to breeze through quickly because I would like to have more time on the dialogue and and the Q and A. Um, so this would just be a quick review of what where we came from and where we are and where we are headed uh, and uh, uh, pardon me but I just had to show some some pretty old charts by now it seems a year ago but actually it's just a few months ago but certainly because of the very different environment we are definitely seeing a different uh, different set of numbers so allow me to show you a, a bit of nostalgia in terms of a chart uh, next uh, first chart please I don't know if you remember this chart. This is a chart that shows the Philippines. It's the second fastest growing. Uh, this was a chart I think I last presented uh, just about February uh, before we really head on to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, Philippines growing 6%. It's the top two. Second fastest growing in the economy in, in ASEAN. Uh, second only to Vietnam. Next chart, another, another set of numbers that would uh, interest us even if you look at the, uh, the second to the last uh, column, it shows Philippines there at 6.7. Um, so if there's an arrow that you know the, uh, the administrator can, can use the pointer, second to the last, yes, down below 6.7% uh, for Philippines. And uh, you can see uh, how, how fast that growth was. And that was the end of uh, the fourth the quarter of 2019. We uh, fulfilled our promise <clears throat> that in uh, as we uh, or as the Congress released the budget at uh, the midpoint of 2019, we will be able to catch up 
and uh, because the first half was really stymied by by the uh, late approval of the uh, budget and it sort of deferred many of the uh, infrastructure spending that that, that we are uh, that's really pulling up also the economy and a very strong domestic demand so but uh, right after that uh, we, we've been experiencing pretty good growth and so uh, we entered the COVID period and the last column uh, you see the contraction in many economies and Philippines is not insulated uh, uh, the, the contraction was pretty much uh, I guess on a flat minus 0.2 percent um, but uh, I, that, that is just covering basically the first quarter and March was the hard hit month and that, that, that was the month when we started with the uh, complete lockdown of uh, the entire Luzon which is the northern biggest island of the Philippines. Next chart. The next chart also showed us uh, on how uh, the, the, the quarterly uh, uh, this is the global economy that is seen to succumb into recession and uh, the forecast is uh, really from a positive three percent for the world growth uh, projected to be a converse of almost not negative three percent and uh, hopefully bouncing back to about 5.8 percent by 2021 okay next And for the Philippines again, uh, the GDP growth turns negative in the first quarter. That this is the chart we showed earlier that showed uh, minus 0 0.2 for uh, first quarter of 2020. Uh, and again, you can see on the third to the right column, the fourth quarter 2019. So you can see a, a big disparity from a positive, strong positive to a slowdown uh, even contracting a bit uh, from GDP of positive 6.7 to minus 0 0.2. Uh, expenditure, which was really a, a strong sector, the consumption spending, 5.7%. Uh, that started to slow down. And we shall get back to that discussion later on how we can uh, pick up again the expenditure and consumption spending. Government spending, of course, was affected from positive 17, which is really the a double digit growth that was uh, being spurred by the build, 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 spending behind infrastructure and, uh, and investment growth of 2.5%. And uh, fortunately for Philippines also, uh, exports was continuing to grow of 0.3%. But uh, if we go through the first quarter, it shows there minus 3%. But I must uh, tell you that the January and February of 2020, exports even posted positive growth. It was just pulled down again in March. Uh, and then on the production side, you see there's strong growth from industry, construction, uh, and that includes industry, includes manufacturing, and of course service. Service is still a main growth driver for Philippines uh, for the fourth quarter. Uh, and hopefully that will lead us again in the, as we recover or bounce back uh, towards the end of Next, uh, some uh, again uh, some uh, nostalgic numbers. I guess uh, the, the previous period just showed again a uh, low record level, uh, very low unemployment rates, underemployment rates uh, from from unemployment from a high of six point six percent in twenty seventeen three years ago. It went down already to range of 4.5 to 5.3 underemployment uh, from 20% in 2016, 2015 to a level of 13% to 14% next. And uh, exports, again, you will see there the January, February uh, blue bar are still in the positive territory, but everything went down when we locked down in March. Even imports went down to it. Next. Uh, and inflation still uh, stable at 2.2% uh, as of April of uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, it is hovering already at that number 2.5, 2.2. Next. 
So uh, inflation is uh, is still uh, managed. So right on on March 15, the COVID-19 pandemic and the declaration of the enhanced community quarantine, and this is where we are right now, uh, with some changes by uh, when by May of 16, a few days from now. So we will be shifting from enhanced community quarantine to a modified community quarantine, and I shall explain it later. Thanks. So during the uh, lockdown, obviously, the, a lot of the uh, commercial establishments uh, were closed, uh, except for the basic ones like supermarkets, drugstores, pharmacies, uh, and, and other retail uh, essential retail stores of essential products. Next. And uh, a series of DTI memorandum circulars that at least during this period, uh, starting March 15, we made it a point that all the cargo should be uh, unhampered, even the, uh, given the importance of continuing trade, of ensuring that there will be no uh, food shortages, ensuring that uh, food manufacturing and other essential products manufacturing will, will continue and will have a, a, you know, a, a strong output because the least or what we do not want to, to happen is uh, amidst the, the, the lockdown, uh, a food shortage would happen and that is not what we want to happen. And of course, uh, we don't know civil unrest, riots might come in, uh, but hopefully, uh, but, but thankfully, I mean, all these things are not happening and we're able to manage because of this basic uh, principle of making sure cargoes and the workers who permit establishments uh, are not unhampered. Uh, you might have heard reports during the first week of uh, imposing this, uh, second, third week of March, we were still encountering some problems, but those have been uh, settled right away. Next, please. Um, and so we, these are the enterprises allowed to operate uh, under ECQ, uh, the old food, food and beverage, non-alcoholic, of course, uh, essential hygiene products, uh, soaps and disinfectants, medicines and medical products, including masks and gloves and PPEs, all the retail establishments, uh, grocery, the likes of groceries and supermarkets, the logistic services that will serve these establishments, uh, hospitals, medical clinics. Delivery service is a, a platform that obviously times like this has been accelerated in terms of the growth. Uh, combined with this is of course the e-commerce platform. Everything digital and everything can be delivered. Uh, at, at the start, we were only limiting it to food, food and essentials delivery, but as the ECQ or, or enhanced community quarantine has been extended, two weeks and two weeks and another two weeks, we started to introduce more products that will be allowed for delivery as the needs of the consumers have, of course, been expanding uh, as the lockdown was being extended. And then, of course, the banks and capital markets, power and utilities are all allowed to operate. And then one key sector that we allow to continue are the exports and the BPO companies. Uh, uh, although we just ask them to locate their employees hopefully in a nearby accommodation, near site, uh, and, and shuttle services because there is no public transport at the beginning. And, uh, but the point is that uh, the exporters and the BPO companies just said that they just want to operate. Uh, they, they were willing to make all these arrangements. And that's the reason why they kept uh, the, the ability to, to continue to operate because of uh, commitments uh, of, of, uh, of meeting the requirements of their clients. Okay, next. Next, please. Okay, and uh, prescribing guidelines, other memo circulars, uh, prescribing guidelines for uh, additional business activities allowed to operate. So this is basically in our intention as the, the ECQ has been extended uh, by, by another two weeks before, and again, another extension, we kept on adding more products that, that can operate. This includes also even the entire value chain, the raw materials and process materials that are inputs to the existing ones, to the existing operating industries. Next, please. 
um, together with uh, any uh, form of uh, declaration of emergency, like this one, a public health emergency, we immediately institute that price freeze. That shows that means that major commodities, uh, basic system, what were their their uh, average price for the past two months, and they will be frozen at that level, at least for 60 days. And that 60 days actually is ending anytime now. I think it's not today or tomorrow. Next. Um, and there's that circular that would limit the number of products, especially basic essentials, because we were, the Filipinos love to panic buy, so we just had to put certain limits on the quantity of items that they can buy in the supermarkets. Next, please. Um, because of a strong campaign against profiteering and hoarding, uh, we continued with uh, several enforcement activities, 262 of them, and about 427 individuals apprehended for price act or hoarding violation. And the values of, value of confiscated uh, products, about 94 million pesos. Next. The sectors opened in the uh, ECQ, so agri industry services totaling 48. They, they are allowed. So in effect, there's about 2.1 million jobs that continued because they are part of the permitted establishments. But notably, in some sectors, uh, they are not operating to 100%, but only or mostly food are allowed to operate uh, close to 100%. So you can expect that jobs there are kept. But for some, there's a kind of alternative work arrangements, allowing work from home and, and other you know, forms of work arrangements. And partially allowed uh, uh, sectors, so there are 19 and 13, and those are the jobs that are uh, basically part of this uh, sector. Uh, next, please. And then the small sectors will be opened by the time uh, we declare GCQ or general community quarantine. Okay, and uh, this, this would be 81 sectors and employment there would be 4.5 uh, million. Okay, next. And this is uh, assuming all areas will be under GCQ. So, and uh, so the sectors open under GCQ comprise 92% of the total number of sectors and employing 93.6 percent of total employment so this would be all sectors open under gcq so the balance that would be left would be just about 6.4 percent increase in the number reflects the reopening of the largest uh, concentration of employment sectors like construction construction normally would account for 10 percent of jobs uh, in, in the country next please and so this will be the remaining sectors, about 6.4% uh, jobs, major jobs. Okay, next. Uh, moving forward, uh, we are telling uh, especially the SMEs and some, some sectors that uh, they can avail of some assistance uh, being offered by government in general. So during the lockdown, there's a social amelioration package provided by other agencies like Department of Social Welfare and Development, uh, Department of Labor, and uh, that, that gives uh, outright grants to the low-income uh, families. Um, and and uh, uh, the Department of Finance, because uh, the SSS and the Bureau of Internal Revenue report under the DOF, they have a complete record of workers uh, that are uh, part of the formal sector in other words they are registered and so they were the ones who administered the wage subsidies uh, basically giving about five thousand to eight thousand pesos per worker that were displaced during the ECQ and that's the form of wage subsidies uh, that were provided and this will be given or this is being given for two months April and June. next please 
Uh, in terms of uh, micro SMEs, they account for 99.5% in terms of the number of establishments. Um, they number about 1 million as far as the Philippine Statistics Office is concerned. Uh, 1 million uh, micro would be about 88%, small would be 11%, medium would be 0.49, and large is 0.48%. Um, and uh, the latest count when we aggregate or consolidate all the business permit application at the, all the local government units, uh, they, they now total 1.5 million. So we can expect or we are seeing already an increase in the total number of establishments uh, from 1 million to 1.5 million as of 2019. And 2018, when we did the count, it was also 1.3 million. So that, those are the latest numbers for uh, the number of registered companies in the Philippines. Uh, just for background, our estimate of unregistered, meaning the very many informal sector or micro entrepreneurs, uh, it ranges from about seven to nine million. We're simply counting the number of borrowers under the so-called microfinance uh, sectors. So that is uh, our estimate of the unregistered numbers, which we are trying to encourage to register and be part of the formal sector. Next, please. Uh, this is a distribution of micro, small, and medium. You can see long bars of colored blue. So that shows the micro entrepreneurs uh, in all the regions from NCR at the top and uh, autonomous region or the what we call now BARM, Bangsamoro Autonomous uh, Region. Uh, that's, uh, so you can see majority, more than majority are dominant the micro entrepreneurs, followed by small entrepreneurs nationwide. Next. So uh, they micro, the micro entrepreneurs, micro SMEs, about half of them would be in the wholesale and retail trade repairs uh, like motor vehicles, motorcycles, and the like. Uh, that's, uh, they account for 46%. 14.5% uh, would be in the accommodation and food service, the fast food or the food kiosk uh, that, that you see around the, the country inside the malls. Manufacturing, MSMEs uh, into manufacturing would be about 11.6%. The balance would be the other sectors. Next, please. Um, in terms of well, nationwide, all regions, um, in terms of the percentage that were closed, especially during the first part of the lockdowns, 56% of the micro SMEs uh, were closed. And uh, limited operation, 14%. And full operation, 30%. If you look at NCR alone, there's a larger percentage. Next chart. A uh, larger percentage of uh, those that stop operation, 70% uh, micro SMEs, uh, especially when we instituted NCR and uh, I guess mostly in, 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 in uh, I'm sorry, the lockdown in NCR. Uh, and mo most micro SMEs are also uh, in the NCR. Those with limited operation, 17%, and full operation, 30%. Next, please. Uh, other issuances to assist micro SMEs, uh, we try to uh, help them uh, by providing uh, certain uh, policies, uh, providing grace period or deferment of the payment of uh, residential rents. And this is part of a law that was uh, uh, urgently passed uh, during, I think, March, uh, a concession of 30 day grace period for residential rents and commercial rents for the micro SMEs, especially that uh, had to, to close or cease operation during the lockdown. Then um, enhance operation for BPOs and export enterprises as we were in the period of extending ECQ. So we, we, we uh, uh, negotiated for greater uh, participation, greater number of workers that we get out to work. We started with 25% skeletal workforce, went up to 50, allowing 50% 50 of workforce, and after that, allowing more than 
percent of the workforce. So that that's the progression as the ECQ was being extended. Um, we told also the, the malls that they can operate a maximum of 12 hours. This is an, in an effort to to address the issue of uh, customers uh, being compressed in a short operating hours. Uh, and we had to do this because different local governments are issuing different ordinances, local ordinances that limit the number of stores uh, working hours or operating hours. So we had to issue a national sort of uh, policy that should allow 12 hours, unless the uh, malls themselves would choose to shorten the number of hours for lack of uh, customers, especially during the late evening. Um, you should also, and a joint administrative order that uh, expedited the release of uh, containers and vans as, as we were seeing a, an, an emerging uh, port congestion, so we tried to deflect or avoid it. Uh, and now this uh, the, uh, percentage utilization has gone down to the levels of 65 to 70%. So we were able to avert uh, It's becoming a problem uh, about two months ago. Next, please. Uh, so some DPI programs that will help micro SMEs uh, will be in providing loans for micro entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm sorry, these are in pesos, 10,000 to 200,000 for micro and uh, 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 up to 500,000 for the small enterprises we shall be giving also livelihood seed, uh, livelihood kits uh, these are uh, uh, business grants to, to the serving entrepreneurs or those attending seminars uh, especially in uh, in uh, communities poor communities um, and also we will continue to provide shared service equipment facilities publication laboratories uh, like 3D printers, laser cutters, or, or things that you need for mass production. So these are the shared service facilities. This is our way to help micro SMEs mechanize or at least put some uh, mass production system in their operation. Next, please. Uh, part of the uh, like in a war, and we're facing a war against an invisible enemy, we decided that we had to convince or invite uh, some manufacturers to repurpose their activities and help us build uh, or produce critical materials that are needed. And these are, of course, uh, health-related materials, PPEs, masks, uh, even ventilators. Uh, we provided assistance to encourage them to repurpose their facilities. Uh, from miscellaneous goods to manufacture of essential products. Help, we help them in sourcing materials locally or even from abroad uh, with the help of our great attaches, the travel of experts for installation of machineries, the registration with the Food and Drug Administration and PESA, linkage with other suppliers and the buyers, the hospitals and the DOH, government agencies. So examples, face masks, there's a one, uh, major source uh, of medtex uh, located in Bataan. Uh, Taiwanese company meant to export all of their outputs, but uh, their, their capacity is about 20, 10 million a month. At the start, they have been supplying the Philippines 2 million, and it was not enough. There was a shortage in mass. We encourage them to produce now 10 million, all for the local requirements. Uh, the Philippines, despite the, all these difficulties in the supply, never issued an export restriction. We did not uh, compel any company to, to divert their products. Uh, we, we just had to talk to them, we negotiate with them, and encourage them to help the country. There was no restriction imposed whatsoever, despite the difficulties in all these supplies. And what we did, we were just trying to find and source out more more suppliers, either from abroad or encourage other companies to, to build uh, the capacity. So one is also a Japanese company, Yoko Isada, uh, which was only producing 2 million as they had the skeletal workforce, but we told them you don't have to go skeletal workforce uh, from 20%, you can increase your 
workforce so that all the extra production you can uh, give to the local uh, community. This would be purchased, of course. Next, please. Uh, other companies, EMS and electronics uh, manufacturer, uh, they are also, uh, together with Dyson, they were also asked to look into producing masks. I think by now they are already doing this. They are also, uh, they will also be producing ventilators. Uh, companies like PNG, they are producing masks for their employees, but they said that they will also donate or supply the public, the public. New Kinko, the Taiwanese company, doing mask and ventilators. 1,000 units uh, ventilator per month. Next, please. And uh, garments manufacturer, corporate uniform company maker, uh, uh, uniform maker in Cebu, uh, Unisol has been, has been uh, some of their facilities they have converted to produce face masks. Reusable, washable face masks, the one that you see in the picture, as well as these reusable PPEs in the bottom right. Next. Uh, the Confederation of Wearables Exporters, OneWeb. Uh, these are garments and wearable exporters. They bonded together to, to repurpose their machines. They're now producing 10,000 PPEs per day, uh, or what we call coveralls. So they are now supplying some hospitals. They are they are, they are uh, improving also on 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 the uh, what do you call this in the, the standards. Uh, they are already using medical grade materials, but uh, now the government is asking for a heat seal, uh, sewn parts. So so uh, they are now also investing in machines to do this. Next please. So these are just some of the. Uh, Efforts to do uh, health-related uh, materials, face shields done by the shared service equipment, the fab labs that we mentioned earlier, together with other schools here, UP, Ateneo, uh, and other DPI publication laboratories. And uh, the ones for, uh, producing Andave foam uh, for the foams and plastics, Mandy plastics, and Philippine plastics. So these are the groups doing face shields. Next. Alcohol uh, products, uh, companies that don't really produce alcohol, they, what, but they've been doing alcoholic beverages. So I guess it's easy for them to shift some of their uh, production to produce alcohol, which was also because of a very strong demand, uh, uh, the supply has not been enough also recently. But with their entry, the supply has eased. I'm sorry, the, the, the shortage has eased. So companies like Distilleria de Mbraco, San Miguel, the group of uh, Lushotan, Asia Brewery, and Alliance Group uh, are now into producing alcohol. Next, please. And the ventilators, other electronic companies, Collins, uh, US UK company doing aerospace parts, Dyson also from UK, uh, and in Singapore, they are they're now uh, working to, to produce uh, ventilators. Next. Um, well, in the midst of uh, the, uh, the ECQ, uh, as we are going towards opening up more uh, business operations, the DPI and the labor department told them, uh, will uh, introduce in the interim guidelines on workplace prevention. So essentially for all uh, operations, uh, offices, factories, whether you're in retail or whatever industries, this would be the basic requirements now. Uh, providing employees, uh, encouraging them to have increased physical and mental resistance. Uh, so the, the, the details are there uh, from, from giving them uh, or joining them to, to take in good food, nutritious food, medicines, vitamins, using masks, uh, daily, uh, uh, daily uh, health uh, declarations, at the taking of a thermometer, uh, temperature scanning, uh, sanitation, uh, equipment, next. Uh, inside the workplace, the need to disinfect, sanitize, just physical distancing, no eating in communal spaces, even uh, that the design of the office should be facing the back, not face to face. 
uh, arrangements, making sure that the space is uh, uh, well ventilated, disinfected, uh, disinfection of vehicles coming in, ensuring social distancing. Uh, reducing transmission also uh, again others disinfection and uh, um, we should also continue to encourage alternative work arrangements uh, so so work from home or four day work week three day work week uh, different work arrangements are now also uh, being encouraged um, wearing of masks and uh, meetings uh, there are some limitations as the number of participants encouraging uh, video conferencing and the like so all these are being done now as minimum health protocol next yes, please uh, and there's these duties of employers and employees but essentially employers are enjoined uh to, to really take care of the, the, the workers and provide all the systems health systems um a um, frequent question to me is, uh, are workers required to do all the tests before they get into work? Uh, with the quarantine that has just been implemented or still being implemented, we expect that the workers, when they go back to work, are expected to be healthy. I mean, otherwise they, they are sick right now or uh, they, they will be symptomatic. So as if the, the question on whether they need to be tested it won't be required, but in their health declaration, if the declaration is such that they have been exposed to a COVID patient or they are, you know, they stay or they visited a COVID patient or they're not feeling well, symptomatic, then that's the time they will be required to take the PCR test. Uh, and there will be a, a SOP uh, for companies on how to do this, where to bring the, the worker, uh, their partnership with hospitals and health insurance companies. To be able for them to make this as a standard of the procedure. Next. Um, okay, I guess this is what I just described. Um, SOP for where to bring the, uh, the workers that are suspected to be sick. Next. Um, there are, of course, uh, identified uh, most at least workers and vulnerable groups. Um, so these are the senior citizens in the Philippines. It's defined as 60 years old and above. Women with high risk pregnancies, workers with comorbidities or pre-existing illnesses. So these employees are highly encouraged to, the employers are highly encouraged to allow these workers to do work from home arrangements. Uh, work agreement should be developed to detail the deliverables of these employees. And there shall be no diminution in wages or benefits. Uh, of course, they will be, you know, their, their, their presence in the office, of course, can be limited to, you know, at certain times. Uh, they may be allowed to uh, go or attend certain functions in the office. Next, please. Um, we also issued some, some guidelines for mall operations. We just go through this quickly, like social distancing. We, policy for senior citizens and other again vulnerable sectors limiting uh, entrances exit uh, next please uh, limiting also the number inside the store in the escalators in the elevators normally they're one half of the usual capacity um, and uh, in terms of the number of number of persons inside the store, for example, it's just a ratio of one person per two square meter of this space. So that's, uh, so if you have a hundred square meter store, uh, free space inside the store, you can accommodate 50 persons maximum at any given point. Next. Uh, okay, you can skip this. I didn't I describe this already. And oh, even regulating temperature so that it won't be that comfortable uh, for people to loiter around. The expectation is people will just continue to uh, do their errands, uh, buy their stuff, and, and should be leaving immediately. Uh, suspension 
uh, of the conduct of sales events, sales events, and marketing events, promos that will attract large funds. Next, please. Um, so this is one chart. I'm shifting a bit now to some economic reports. Again, selected emerging economies rank on four measures of financial strength. And happy to note that Philippines is one of the, the high top ranking countries in terms of its ability to manage public debt, foreign debt, the cost of borrowings, and the research power. So we rank number six. Okay, next. And uh, so reviving the economy, where do we want to go? So we are preparing, we have a recovery, business recovery plan, but we continue to find things to stimulate the economy, shore up business and consumer confidence, safeguard the number of workers and industries, and mobilize assistance for critical supplies and support post-crisis manufacturing growth. So aside from the uh, economic stimulus measures I mentioned earlier, there's also a proposal from Congress on uh, more economic stimulus measures, uh, support uh, business resumption, including worker health and safety, initiatives aimed at increasing manufacturing productivity, support business or reorientation toward future markets, sales channels, investment in innovation and domestic markets. In particular, for example, the way we would like to reinvent or consider other business models in, in food uh, logistics, uh, you know, addressing also the requirements of the agri sector, managing their produce, uh, limiting the number of traders and allowing uh, more models that will shorten the distance between producers and the end market. And of course, we'll continue with the stimulation of spending for the third and fourth quarter of this year, uh, mainly uh, powered by the investments in the build build bill, which will continue to be the, the main program of the country, of this government, uh, essentially also to as a way to keep the number of jobs, uh, a strong, big number of jobs being employed by the field group. Field group. Next, please. So our task is really to bring back business, micro SMEs, and bring back jobs. Yes. Uh, so I've mentioned already the uh, some programs here. The one billion for the micro is small. There is a 500 million pesos for loan for micro for the medium enterprises, the seeding program of 200 million, and uh, 30 billion, the one on top, uh, that we are uh, managing or working out with the Development Bank of the Philippines and the NAN Bank. This is basically a more financing program for the micro SMEs. For the large companies, we have the Development Bank of the Philippines that can also provide a window for. Uh, uh, loans for the larger companies. Uh, the Congress, uh, in a bill that's now being discussed, is uh, to give a grant of 10 billion to improve business resilience. So, this would uh, include uh, uh, helping uh, basically micro SMEs uh, in terms of giving them more grants for education, training, counseling. Uh, to improve uh, business resiliency, uh, prevention, uh, and containment of transmissions of disease. So these are some of the assistance that can be given as we ask them also to uh, institute uh, those uh, minimum health standard programs. Uh, encouraging them to be on online platform, telework, online consulting. Then there's the 80 billion uh, additional fund uh, bridging loans for micro SMEs. Uh, this is planned to be passed through the Small Business Corporation, SBC, that will increase the availability of loanable funds from that 1 billion I mentioned the chart before to hopefully bringing this up to the 80 billion pesos. And uh, more uh, for 44 billion pesos for industrial development, grants to support activities into business resilience. Uh, education, training, and advising. So this would be the assistance to the manufacturing and services sector. Uh, this is where I, I would always uh, 
push for hopefully upgrading uh, the, the manufacturing sector that we have, you know, moving towards smart manufacturing. And uh, of course, the continuous innovation and uh, digital transformation. That's it's okay. Uh, the industry promotion strategy. So we're uh, talking again to potential investors uh, around the region, especially those that have indicated to look into operations outside. Uh, let's say some companies have indicated to find places outside China, uh, either as an expansion or relocation. Uh, so we are talking to many of these companies to uh, hopefully consider the Philippines as their main next move. Next. Um, encouraging more uh, e-commerce uh, platforms. We've been doing a lot of these uh, uh, online webinars as well uh, during this lockdown. Where I think we're, we've done already two of these and doing two more uh, before the listing of the ECB. So this is meant for micro SMEs. Investment facilitation. So these are now on manufacturing support. Uh, we facilitated the entry of uh, foreign company officials to continue their critical operations, jumpstart new production facilities. We link companies to government agencies and hospitals for procurement, provided assistance in sourcing of materials and components. Um, it's a Sweden group, uh, fan motors for ventilators, electronic components for patient monitors, and then Lands, uh, power components for COVID 19 testing kits uh, from South Korea and other stuff. They adopted a policy to consider domestic sales of essential goods as export sales. So, this is uh, one uh, uh, fraction or incentive that we offered those exporters that we I was talking about earlier. So, we did that, uh, we, we did not compel them to, we did not restrict their move. But we said that you know any domestic sales we can consider them as export sales so that you can still meet your export requirement or export commitment. So we we we've uh, exercised flexibility in this regard. Next, we have liberalized the grant of incentives for manufacture and importation of critical or needed equipment. So together with the Department of Finance, uh, DPI uh, issued. This joint memo circular exemption from import duty and taxes. Uh, we've also included in the investment priorities plan uh, to be signed anytime now for 2020 onwards all qualified activities relating to the fight against COVID 19 pandemic. So these are the items uh, identified as uh, those that would be given incentives or eligible for POI incentives. Next, please. Okay, then there's this uh, program to encourage people to take on just Manila and go back to the provinces. So uh, for the DTI, we're doing a lot of, uh, again, part of the ITP to provide more years of income tax holiday, uh, as well as in the CITIRA, uh, the, this is the Corporate Income Tax uh, Investment Nationalization, uh, where we manage uh, to put a provision that will grant more years if they locate outside the company. More years of incentives. Thanks. Uh, we'll continue with the build, build, build again for job uh, creation, uh, encouraging by local advocacy to the go local marketing moves, the passage of the CTRA bill, uh, attracting investors, hopefully, be going into the ease of doing business, which has just started in the country, and providing more funds for the micro. Okay, last few charts. Or, okay, next please. So this is just a listing of the other uh, critical moves uh, moving forward, ensuring food production for agriculture, mobilized logistics for food production, I mentioned smart manufacturing, uh, going to digital. Uh, one uh, good news also is I've talked to the Department of Labor Secretary and in the interest of uh, being companies being able to retain their workers, uh, we shall be instituting, uh, I guess, uh, a more uh, flexible work arrangements 
in labor, allowing four days per week or flexible work hours, allowing contractual, contractual workers, uh, those that need to work as well. Uh, there may be, and I'm not sure about the first uh, part, which is each of the individual wage. Um, uh, it, we may maintain it, but what we have to work on is uh, considering uh, flexible work arrangements in labor, allowing also authorized leaves for workers. Uh, okay, then the DTI attaches uh, abroad to continue to attract investments, hopefully promote uh, trade when the global market will also be opening up again. Uh, we shall be increasing the hiring of more workers as our small business corporation implement all this funding support to micro SMEs. So that's our contribution also to creating more jobs. So we need to hire more uh, lending and program development workers. I'm sure other agencies uh, shall be helping out in, in this uh, emergency uh, job creation, uh, government hiring them for new requirements, especially health-related or COVID-related programs. Next. Um, okay, uh, these are just the, all these uh, entrepreneurship, more grassroots uh, training and uh, livelihood uh, provision. Next, please. Um, okay, revitalize and enhance. Okay, I mentioned this. And uh, focus on key and strategic. Okay, next. So, and hopefully, I, I, I started with this chart, and hopefully, this is this is a chart that we will be going back to, and the numbers that we shall be going back to in the near future as the economy uh, do all those things. And again, uh, since we we uh, we were having a very good uh, economic. Uh, growth. Uh, we hope to easily bounce back to this level of growth as the economy reopens and hopefully the world reopens. Again, uh, bringing back all this growth momentum to our respective economies. Okay, next. I think this is the end. So we can be great again. I, I, I just occurred to me, great is a, a slogan of UK for this world. <laughs> Okay, next, I okay. guess, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Lopez. This is, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, this is, for those just joining, this is, I'm Chris Nelson, the Executive Director and Trustee of the British <laughs> Chamber. Uh, we've just had Secretary Lopez. Sir, I believe we can share the presentation. Uh, so... We will do that with all the people here. Uh, I have had, uh, we're inundated with questions. So please, we'll have to just ask some and then we will send, and I think there's a commitment, we'll, we'll collate all that and we will get answers back to people because as you've rightly stressed, dialogue is very important and yes. we wish to keep that going. <clears throat> uh, before I do that, I'd just like to say we've also been joined by some other members of the diplomatic corps and I just like to mention that we have the German ambassador on as well, Anka Riffenstuhl. I mean, if I've mispronounced that, ma'am, I do apologize. We also have the Philippine ambassador, Philippine ambassador from Germany who's dialing in, and I think that's Ms. Dizron de Vega. Oh. And we also have the deputy head of mission from the Belgium, and I think that's Conrad Dupont. So... And if there's anybody else, again, I'd like to acknowledge, and again, obviously, we already have the Spanish ambassador, we already have the regional director of the British embassy. So the first question, and I will try to keep this, and then I will do a summary or wrap up at the end. Um, the first question is, is it a fair, currently Metro Manila or Lausanne is going to move to a modified ECQ? Uh, is it a fair assumption that at the end of that modify, which we believe it's two weeks, which is the 31st of May, i.e. from the 1st of June, is it a fair assumption to be looking at the general quarantine, which I think is GCQ, uh, general quarantine yes. 
section. Yes. Could you kindly answer that first? Yes, of course, uh, I would answer that with uh, tentative yes. Uh, all things, uh, that all things should uh, improve, then I uh, guess that is a fair assumption to make uh, that DCQ would be uh, achievable by the end of the month, moving into June 1 onwards. Um, uh, we, we, fortunately, our uh, health statistics have been improving, but uh, we still need to be more comfortable with the numbers with respect to the health facilities while they are increasing. Uh, we would say that the levels are not in the comfortable uh, range yet. Uh, we are close to the warning zone and, and not below the warning zone as far as, let's say, the number of uh, isolation, ICU beds, uh, uh, and rooms, um, uh, the testing capacity. So uh, these are still being built right now. But but as we increase all these capacities, it will allow us to open more. And obviously, from our end, we'd like to open as much as possible. The president has, anyway, given a, a low signal. And that's the reason why we have moved to modify. So it's a, it's a period in between ECQ and the general community quarantine, uh, wherein almost all the other sectors have been allowed to, uh, have been allowed to open. Uh, although at a 50% so-called partial opening of 50%, but at least they can start moving in and uh, bringing in their workers and starting to operate again. And I'd say practically all. The remaining sectors are just a few of them. And uh, I don't know, I should have shown, shown the chart that just came out uh, last night. So any, if our staff can, can show those charts later, uh, Maybe that would be a good visual. Or if not, you can just share it. Yeah, so what I suggest, if that's okay, sir, we'll have all that sent out later, right? Uh, and share that. Uh, also, can I just mention, we've also been joined by the Swedish ambassador, Hello. Harald Fries. So thank you very much. Um, and to all the diplomatic, everybody else who's joined in, we're very much welcome. Uh, let me move on. Um, let me also raise one which obviously as foreign chambers we're very interested in which is how we can improve foreign investment into the country and like all countries i think it's fair to say sir the philippines will be needing further investment everybody at this moment are there plans to remove or reduce red tape and further reduce foreign investment in, the, in terms of foreign ownership uh, so if you could answer that point please yeah so then we we'll, we continue all those reforms that uh, we've been uh, that have been cited uh, and we've been citing this before the liberalization of the retail trade the move uh, the move towards Sakira, which is really lowering the uh, income tax rate uh, corporate income tax rate uh, and still giving incentives uh, even for those export oriented and in fact has liberalized also in the current draft liberalized the the transition, the number of years uh, where we will allow those uh, enjoying incentives to still enjoy, especially if it's a highly performing expert uh, oriented company. Uh, I think the latest draft contains, I think, seven years transition period. Uh, you know, before we were just talking of two years and five years. Uh, now uh, we, uh, we have that number of seven years. And I think there are talks because of COVID-19 and the need to stimulate the economy, uh, there, there are talks where we can do a big drop in the corporate income tax, rather than, remember last time, it's a one yeah, year, yeah. one stage point per year. So we can do an immediate drop. I think uh, it's in discussion right now, but uh, off the record, it is probably five percentage point drop, one time, big time at the start, and then one percent point. A percentage point after. So the, these are the possible possibilities just for us to be able to immediately uh, re-stimulate the, the economy. Okay, and that, so that, Yeah, the, and also the opening up of, uh, of course, more sectors uh, allowable for foreign equity investments. That's very good. As you can appreciate, the foreign, uh, all our chambers and all foreign investors are very keen on that. Can I bring you to uh, some issues that have been raised, of course, 
One of them is concerning, I'm sure you're familiar, LGUs. Um, we've had issues raised by heavy logistics companies, by different companies, where they're still encountering different rules and regulations or interpretations, right? And I know that obviously the interagency and yourselves are trying to make this standard, but could you just kind of give further clarity on how this can be improved? Because our members are still encountering difficulties. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. That uh, we we uh, commiserate with you. That's really our heart, our headache, especially at the start of this quarantine period. Uh, but uh, I, I must say that uh, ever since we started and uh, instituted a command center, wherein uh, the PNP, the Philippine National Police, those manning the checkpoints, the representatives are part of that command center. The DPI, part of that, the Department of Interior and Local Government. Uh, coordination would be faster so any complaints they're in about checkpoints and all that have been quickly addressed in less than five minutes they can immediately connect with the checkpoint involved and the cargo can be allowed to pass if there are those uh, hardships uh, that were experienced uh, of course it was really really tough at the first week, the first week i must say uh, uh as much complaints uh, many complaints which uh, but I must say, in the in the recent weeks, we hear less and less of these problems. Uh, yes, after the LGUs, here comes the barangay level, the, the smallest village unit, instituting uh, their own. They're over eager to implement this checkpoint. So again, uh, uh, the, 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 those were addressed by. In, at the end of the day, we we ask them not to institute checkpoints. In other words, uh, the checkpoints will only be limited to police, which has which is under the control of the Department of Interior and Local Government. So greater, greater coordination uh, started to happen. Uh, so again, if there are still problems, uh, we hope there's none anymore, but uh, if there are still, please let us know immediately. We'll have and can you let us know later, and we're more than happy to publish that, if there yeah. are emergency numbers or ways that our members can contact, because I still think there are some issues ongoing, even despite all your efforts, sir. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can issue, there are a lot of posters on this, so our staff can email those command center numbers. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to here pick a series of questions. So for anybody who sent questions in, if you don't get answered today, please forgive me. I'm trying my best. One that's come in, which I think is off your chart, sir was about looking at growth of 5.8% in 2021, I believe, right? Uh, or looking yes. at growth again. Can you just kind of give an indication where do you think what industries will be able to contribute to that? How do you see that going forward? Thank you. Yeah, going forward, we expect double digit growth again for the construction industry, brought about by the build, build, build. And as you know, our Build, Build, Build Tsar is the brother of Ambassador De Vega, uh, very much at the helm of uh, this uh, very big uh, program. He's uh, our Build, Build, Build Tsar and uh, managing very well. Uh, that's the reason why he was also appointed Deputy what's this, uh, COVID-19 National Task Force Implementer. So a very good uh, man, uh, President Vince, uh, uh, he's on. And, um, and uh, that, so the, this will come from construction, this will come from industry, uh, manufacturing, we expect to contribute again uh, to the level of about 4 to 5%. Uh, agriculture is in a good run uh, under the new leadership of uh, the uh, EA Secretary, uh, William Dar, uh, who's put more I guess align the programs together with the DPI. Uh, they now talk of value adding agriculture products, increasing value, uh, agriculture productivity, modernization, all the stuff that we'd like to hear and is really putting into uh, these programs budget and, and actual, actual programs for implementation. So we believe in uh, Secretary Dara, it will give agriculture the needed push because Agriculture you know, has been is a sector that's been really a bit lagging in the in the recent years, uh, but so we expect them to bounce back at least more than two percent uh, faster than the growth of population, so that they can feed more uh, the Filipinos. 
uh, and of course services which continue to which were which was growing by uh, five point five to six percent expected again to pull up the, the economy hopefully later than six percent okay uh coming to the stimulus bill which i believe is currently in congress right sir and right. i hope that that's going to be signed off i believe there's indications first week of june and that obviously is very important for everybody um in that stimulus bill is there a lot of support to smaller companies smes medium sized because many of our members are those and will it also include foreign owned? Because we have a lot of companies who are in the export zone who are also providing work and they are foreign owned, but they're also struggling because they've not been able to do their full business. So overall, when will this focus on smaller to medium sized companies and will it also cover foreign owned? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so as mentioned, those are the funds uh, that have been uh, being worked out right now. So it would be open to those respective sizes of business. Okay, and that will also include so foreign a company in the an export zone can also try to apply and, and look at those yes, funds yes, as possible. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, by the way, I have a thank you, sir, from you as well. Not a question. I think you were the one who said that seniors were not going to be under house arrest. I think that was so. <laughs> One of our seniors has sent a note saying thank you for, for the clarification and they can go out and uh, they appreciate that you clarified that along with everybody else. So thank you very much. That's so, so just a thank you, sir. Um, can you give us a kind of roadmap or vision on service orientated businesses that are currently closed or not yet clarified is that a fair point under gcq example uh hairdressers barbers which i'm sure uh from what i understand the single biggest queue in new zealand today because they've opened up is for barbers yeah um that's true and, and also for hotels and restaurants uh and yeah. also cinemas because you know, the Philippines is a very strongly driven consumer market and that's critically important as an engine for the economy. And we all want to try and support everybody that we can. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, uh, you know, in this uh, interagency, only la only yesterday, oh, sorry, the other day, I'm sorry, yesterday, that, that we had this long discussion. Uh, it's a, it's a policy question in general, but sometimes you dig into specific sectors and one questionable sector was this, uh, I mean, the barber shop and so on. And, and there's a recognition that this is a sector that, that uh, in the country uh, would provide jobs to about 400,000. Uh, so a big sector. Uh, unfortunately, as we balance the economic benefit, it is also counterbalanced by a, a sector that has high rate of transmission. And in many accounts, and from many countries, this has been cited also as a, a sector that has been uh, been the cause of uh, a lot of uh, transmitted COVID uh, positive patients. So, so we're a, a bit more careful. We are not saying a, a final no yet, but uh, until we are very determined, I guess, uh, uh, very clear on the, the health protocol, and believe, and as long as uh, we get to be convinced that the health protocol would be reasonable enough to contain the transmission, uh, we we would be very careful on this sector. But but once we are convinced on this, of course, we will be opening this up uh, because we are telling ourselves. I mean, as long as there's pandemic for let's say over a year, barber shop will be closed. So it's not realistic as well. So, but cert so certainly this is one sector we will also open, but uh, but but for now, uh, until we are convinced yet on the uh, protocol, we shall be hang holding on to this. Uh, okay. You know. All right. Thank you, sir, for that. Can I also ask a, a backup question? Because, as you know, obviously the world in general, with I think only a few islands who've never actually had an issue are all struggling or all dealing with opening up their economies, right? Um, 
and we have a number here today. Uh, the UK has just changed its system, Germany, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, all the Portugal across Holland. So my question actually, or the question raised is, are, is the Philippine government also looking across the world at what other governments are doing? Are they also getting feedback in terms of what's happening there to try and also, because I assume this is an ongoing process yeah. and obviously everyone's trying to learn from everybody else. If you could give some thought on that. Yes, correct. In, in, in fact, uh, the, the reason why we held on to that barber shop issue is because of this experience uh, in other countries. So we're learning from experiences in other countries where a breakout happened and it was traced to the salon business. So I, I, and, and this, is, uh, this will continue to be the, the source of, of information, looking also at best practices. Uh, as uh, you know, our way to manage uh, moving forward, you know, all these policies. So we will continue to consider all these, uh, you know, how, what the other countries are doing and how are they opening up the economy, focusing, let's say, what if there's an island uh, province that's safe from everything, shall we open this up? Uh, so these are questions also in our mind that, that uh, I guess we will continue to, to study and uh, consider you know ways of how to open them up as uh, of last count yesterday uh, you must have heard of i think over 40 provinces that have somehow been given a you know a, a, a clean uh, you know what's this uh, a, a good rating yeah yeah I but, but 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 just to be safe they were just placed under gcq but frankly they are a rank better than gcq uh, so so we see the potential of this areas as probably the areas that will hopefully be open up really soon uh, but for now the, the, the confidence for the all the provinces uh, we just have to manage also migration movement of people uh, within you know this is the reason why we continue to have this uh, quarantine mode Okay, and look, I think, I think also all the chambers are very happy to share and give you inputs from our different mm -hmm. chambers yeah. around the world. Uh, and yeah. that's one thing we can do. Just link, you just mentioned a point about migration. There's a question raised about obviously travel and tourism, right? Mm -hmm. And what are the government's plans to help? Uh, because obviously I think it's fair to say aviation and obviously tourism are clearly some of the most affected sectors and yet it's also important both for moving people and goods travel so if you can give us any thoughts on the government plans to help travel and tourism um, it's a industry sector that's uh, i guess uh, really tough to, to open as what we've been seeing also uh, even uh, filipino overseas filipino workers uh, coming back home um, and they are put in quarantine, they get tested. Uh, there's a pretty high uh, percentage of uh, COVID positive. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, travelers, whether they're Filipinos or non-Filipinos, uh, would always be posed as a great threat, I mean, uh, to all of us, to all, all our countries. So uh, there's a bit of uh, trepidation or uh, I guess the, 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 the openness, uh, or the, the, the mindset to open tourism, I guess, is not yet there. Uh, but uh, definitely time will come when, when everyone, all, this, all the countries, will be more comfortable in, in welcoming this. So, so far right now, what we've been uh, welcoming or at least allowing to enter would be returning for overseas Filipinos, uh, or overseas Filipino workers, as well as uh, expats, uh, working in the country uh, of course those are given special uh, permits but I, I, I guess it will be tough time for tourism uh, as we speak much as we want to open it up and therefore even the hotels the hotel business uh, while they are on GCQ uh, in, in those parts they will continue to be used for special purpose uh, to, to house those on quarantine or for long long term uh, stay of some foreigners or locals as well. 
Can I just add a further question? We understand on tourism. What about on aviation, sir? Because obviously the Philippines also had prior to this a lot of inter uh, city travel by air as well as by road and by sea. And that's also part of the economy, right? Um, do you see that resuming and when? Because obviously people don't just do work in, in one location, right? And, and specialized people are needed in other areas uh, as well as travel overseas. If you give some further thought on aviation. So aviation in the domestic scene, I guess, that's what you're referring to. Domestic and also then ultimately internationally. Yeah, but even for domestic for now, um, even for uh, TCQ to TCQ areas, the movement is still quite uh, limited to those like returning residents of those areas. Uh, it's not as if traveling or for leisure or tourism will be allowed even under TCQ. Um, and uh, I think this is in one sector that probably we don't see opening up in, in one month or, or maybe two. Uh, but hopefully uh, after that, uh, we can see a, uh, a return uh, a bounce back of this uh, sector really boils down to finding that vaccine and cure. So and until we are very, very certain, uh, we, we will be very conservative in this uh, sector. Okay, um, moving on also in terms of the current, uh, sorry, it's going to an ECQ, to a modified ECQ, um, there was obviously a, uh, a circular issued on the deferment of rent, which I think was under ECQ. Does that also apply, one of the questions is, under modified as well? Uh, and if you can give some thought there. Uh, can you repeat the first part, the determination? Yeah, yeah, so sorry, sorry. The, uh, during the ECQ, we believe, as you mentioned, that companies could or office could ask for a deferment on the rent of their oh, offices rent. or building. And now the, moving to a modified ECQ, does that deferment still apply? And what happens under a general commu uh, community quarantine? Could you just Correct. kind of clarify? Yes. Uh, so for uh, first the loans, uh, deferment or grace period, paying loans, uh, deferment with no interest and charges and fees, uh, residential rents, commercial rents shall all be given a grace period during all this community quarantine. Uh, ECQ, modified ECQ, and even GCQ. So there will be a deferment, but, so here's a but. The operative word when it comes to commercial rent would be those that cease operations. So if the, the company is already allowed to operate during modified or during uh, GCQ, then uh, obviously the, uh, the grace period will stop and they can, uh, you know, the clock starts ticking uh, as to the count of 30 days uh, from the last due date, uh, by which uh, after the 30 days, they will start to pay back again the commercial rent. So the operative word is uh, those that are not operating during this quarantine period, they can continue to enjoy the, the deferment, uh, the grace period. Okay. Um, just coming on to uh, also, and maybe you can give us a further update. During the ECQ, particularly in March and April, we had reports of a lot of congestion in the ports. Uh, cargo's not moving out. Uh, can you give us an update? And also going forward, how is that now operating? Or again, is there any guidelines? Because obviously some of the companies that could were being hampered both ways, right? In terms of yeah. exports and so imports. That, yeah, so that, that emerges as a, as a uh, problem that was uh, uh, getting to be uh, bigger, uh, moving into a port congestion level. So we had to issue a joint administrative order that, that provided certain uh, provisions, uh, deadlines in processing the different parts of uh, you know, processes in, inside the port so that we can immediately release the, the, 
containers are for shipment. Um, and and uh, considering also after a certain date, there will be abandonment uh, of these uh, containers so, so that we can uh, really uh, uh, put pressure on the, the importers, uh, consignees to pull out their containers. So I think the, the Jiao has uh, resulted so far in the reduction in the number of containers inside. Uh, the, the, every day I get the report uh, from uh, the Bureau of Customs Commissioner and has been uh, reporting. The latest event went down to, uh, in the two ports, I think 65 and 70 percent. So we're in pretty good uh, level. Uh, of course, individually, some country, some some uh, companies, uh, shippers are are still having their respective problems, and uh, there is also a suggestion to make some adjustment on the job in terms of the number of days before it can be considered abandoned. So these are the things that we will be working out uh, as we speak. Uh, there was that uh, request that came in today or yesterday, so there will be some adjustment. But so far, in general, the the port congestion was avoided. That this uh, uh, it was a threat for some weeks, uh, then, about three weeks ago. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a couple. If you go okay for time, sir, I'll ask a couple more before we wrap yep. up. Um, and again, I just want to say we will send you anything that we've not covered because a lot keep coming in and it's not possible to cover everything. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a question about. Local markets are providing an opportunity. Uh, I'm talking the local Philippine market uh, at this stage compared to maybe international markets because everybody's struggling. Could DTI help with easing, I, I think, BOC procedures, customs procedures, and waiving duties and fees for PESA companies who are now trying to sell their products locally and not just for export? I think you mentioned this, but maybe you can go into some more detail. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, together with, uh, with uh, uh, what's this, uh, uh, move to consider local shipment as uh, export compliance, uh, export shipment, uh, definitely we will assist on all those uh, uh, requests that has impact on the payment of custom, uh, customs uh, taxes, especially as they uh, uh, what you call this, uh, execute their domestic sale. Because if they will be going out of their, let's say, Pesos Echo Zone, uh, Freeport Zone, then the corresponding taxes on inputs will have to be paid. Uh, and, and so these are things, that the details of which I'm sure the, our uh, officers will be able to help companies uh, concern. I, I see our export director is here, Senen Perlada. So, He's one guy who can definitely help the exporters. Okay, again, I think it would be very good because one thing I just also want to stress, and I'm sure you agree, sir, is that we want to keep this as an ongoing dialogue and progress so if we can have names and work with people. Uh, I'll just ask two more, if I sure, may. Uh, one is on CITRA, uh, the CITRA bill, which I think is in Congress. Okay. Um, do you expect, uh, do you think it will be happening? And, and I think you mentioned some changes. Do you have an idea of the timing on it? I think you made some references to the corporate tax element. Yeah. And of course, there has been a creation, I think, a lot of uncertainty. I think it's fair. And there is obviously a link to the fact that may have reduced uh, foreign direct investment. So. I would like to get your thoughts and maybe your points so that give some assurances to obviously the people listening because obviously we have a lot of PESA investors here. Yeah. So, um, well, one thing we, uh, we can be assured of is that uh, for uh, high export oriented uh, or those employing uh, to a, a you know, great number of uh, creating a great number of jobs, uh, they will be given extra consideration in terms of the transition period. Uh, the last number I heard is about seven years. Uh, uh, well, from what, from again, uh, since we've not discussed this recently with the Senate, um, uh, I, and, and I will be, 
uh, we will be uh, showing up to the Senate uh, next week, so we'll have greater clarity uh, as to the, uh, the appetite right now. But uh, this is one thing that uh, we'd like to pass. Uh, again, we believe that this can further attract more investments to the extent that we can still address the, those existing locators by allowing longer transition and uh, keeping the number of jobs that they, that they have especially now post covid i'm sure there will be more consideration on, on this aspect so uh, we'll have to wait and see what would be the final number we can expect that it can only get better okay and then when it comes to the so that's on the length of transition and when it comes to uh, those new investments the corporate income tax rate those outside the zone that's a general corporate income tax I guess it's one area that will be uh, that we where we will have, uh, I guess, a, a faster reduction this time. So it's a, so as to stimulate investments, and for, again for new investment also, uh, they will continue to have all these incentives that are given to uh, PESA locators or or other other uh, investment promotion uh, agencies uh, and. In other words, incentives are not taken away. The income tax, in fact, there will be longer years of income tax holidays, as well as uh, uh, followed by a number of years of lower corporate income tax. Uh, there will be more deductibles as an option, you know, on paying taxes, wherein uh, more deductibles can be considered. Even deduction on direct labor, deduction on, on uh, Infrastructure reduction on R and D and training, uh, and and and, and uh, I think there's even deduction uh, for for local content. So a lot of a lot of deduction that can be can be added so that we can come up, we'll arrive at a lower uh, tax due number. Uh, so these are, I guess, there'll be more incentives also to be given. So again, incentives are not taken away; they are just we're just basically putting a cap. And then again, for those existing, that cap, we're working on that transition. So that's the one that I guess that matters to many of the, the investors right now. Okay. So again, high performing and have longer transition. I'll give the last three questions. Uh, one I think is from my fellow chambers because they're asking where does chambers or member organizations fit in? So I think, uh, in terms of industry, we're trying to help in terms of exports, sir, right? So <laughs> I think the question is, uh, we're at the forefront with you. So I think we're classified certainly as chambers in trying to help in terms of export and business. I would hope you would agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, there's no problem there. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Two other questions. One is construction. Uh, is this also a construction uh what about on the private real estate and property developers can they resume work can they start working on condominiums or any other buildings that they're working on uh prior obviously to this pandemic yeah uh so construction has also been opened up uh even under modified ecqs uh, and in fact it's not limited to public even private uh, my recollection of the discussion is only the small projects, personal homes are, are excluded, but all the other construction, building a factory, an office, uh, all those other projects, I, I remember that those are now allowed, uh, the construction, private construction. And of course, the, the public construction will also be allowed. So it's, it has taken a liberal interpretation. And moving into the GCQ, uh, all public and private, no more limitation. All public and private will be, construction will be allowed. Okay, final question, sir. This is, I think it's fair to say for all governments, this is very difficult. Uh, and it's also very difficult to write completely comprehensive guidelines, right? I mean, it's, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. We appreciate all that. Is there a mechanism also in terms of giving feedback? Because obviously companies will be working together. They're trying to look at protocols. Is there a way of also feeding back to you and to the Interagency Task Force ideas? Because 
Uh, nobody has the, the all answers. I think that's a fair statement, right? Mm. Uh, and we just yeah, want to show course. how we can do this together. So is there a mechanism for them to give Guy or in the, to feedback to you and to the interagency? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all are in the fiber. Uh, you know me, if you can text me anytime, any time of the day. Uh, you can, if there is a consolidation of all this feedback or suggestions, we'll be gladly, you know, considering all those. Uh, you can kindly just send to me. I can farm it out as well to the other members of the committee. These are actually our sources of feedback. Uh, there are, uh, I guess that's the most efficient ones. Uh, the other form is uh, like having this kind of forum uh, where we can invite other secretaries maybe next time and for you to converse with them. I, I, just like what you're doing in the forums back here, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Manila, in the Philippines. So we can do it online as well. So, so these are other forms. But the, the fastest way is uh, in a, in a, in a digitally in a paper and uh, sending it in fiber. Uh, we'd, we'd, appreciate it. we'd appreciate it. Okay, sorry. One final question, uh, and uh, it's just co it's come in, and I should raise this. Uh, and this regards liquor ban, right? Because <laughs> liquor ban was not, if I understand correctly, a national policy. Yes, it's not. Uh, it's by certain uh, municipalities or cities. Yeah, And the point raised is these companies are also paying a lot of taxes, there are members, and of course, uh, if drinking is done in the home and moderately, uh, then why not? And can the DTI help? Because these companies also are providing employment and regular taxes. And what can be done as we move into GCQ or even now? Yeah, uh, we'll help. Uh, you know, frankly, we were not helping in the past because um, it's pretty, uh, I guess, uh, the situation is fluid, you know, most are in ECQ. But as we go into modified and, and DCQ, and uh, uh, I guess the marketing distribution of, of liquor should be more open than before, uh, we can start talking also to LGUs not to be too strict on this. Uh, yes, we can help. Uh, in the past, uh, as you know, we just cannot openly help because we were also banning the manufacturing of, of, of liquor. What we just said before, uh, since they are in the non-essential, uh, they cannot manufacture, but you, all your inventories you can continue to sell out there. But now that we are allowing even the manufacturing, I, I guess it's okay for us to provide some help even in in, uh, be very, yeah, because actually that's major companies across all our chambers and they would certainly appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Secretary Lopez, I'm going to call it, uh, uh, I have to, um, we appreciate your time. Uh, I think it's fair to say I made sure that you came, I pressed you very hard. So on behalf <laughs> of myself personally, I'd like to thank you because uh, yeah. we know how time you is. Can I just end with a few points? Uh, first of all, on behalf of my fellow chambers, I must thank them. This is a collective effort and shows a uh, European uh, with all my fellow chambers that we're trying to actually bring all our members and help everybody during these very difficult times. Can I also say that uh, we are also been supporting um, we had a webinar with Joey Conception, so all of our chambers have been supporting and promoting uh, promoting uh, the Project ARC, um, which has been a, a key thing, and I think that's mass testing. And just to let you know that, because I think that's part of what the government's looking at, we're also hoping to get Senator Gordon here because obviously we support what the Red Cross has done and we give them kudos. And of course, all the support that our member companies have given in terms of their contribution, CSR to PPE and so forth. Mm -hmm. The final thing I'd like to say, if I may, we fully understand the health and the health issues. 
But to quote Joey Conception, I believe he said it, it's time to take a little bit of a risk. And I think going forward from the business perspective, and I don't know if that's correct, we're trying to see how we can manage the risk in the best possible way, right? Mm -hmm. And we just like to reiterate that all the chambers and members really want to help you and we want to get business moving again. And I think on that, we have a totally unified aim. Uh, I hope that's clear. Again, thank you very much. You've been very uh, accommodating uh, as usual. And we just want to wish everybody out there who's been dialing in, thank you very much for your contributions. We apologize again if we haven't covered all the questions. Rest assured they will be covered. We will share your presentation. And we just like to say thanks again for all your support. And we look forward to working with you to get not just 5.8%, but maybe even higher growth rate. And Great. wishing you a very good day. Secretary thank Lopez, thank you very much. Would you just like to say a final word to the view, to everybody watching? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and to all our friends, uh, uh, the respective uh, the ambassadors and uh, good friends from the chambers, various chambers, and everyone in the, this forum. And my colleagues in the DPI, uh, I saw the, the Director Sanen and, and uh, even Michelle, our special trade representative uh, in, uh, based in the UK. Um, but certainly the DPI definitely has always taken the position that uh, we have to reopen as early as possible. And I've been the one of the few voices in the IATF to really, uh, I've been encouraging uh, to open up the economy and, uh, uh, and, and really manage the, the risk. I mean, we believe that health and economy is not a, they're not a dichotomy. They, they, co they can uh, really coexist. And, uh, but one thing clear is that as we open up, we have to be very careful in managing the risk. And this is with respect to compliance to the minimum health protocols of all kinds of business operation. That will be a given and that will be the new requirement, the new normal and that, that will be, uh, uh, that will be ensured, uh, you know, that this will be implemented and there will be, I guess, uh, uh, self-policing among us, even the chambers, uh, on your respective companies to make sure that transmission, you know, that your company will not be the source of, of transmission. So again, as, as the IATF considers all these things, please note that we are just finding that balance between reducing transmission and opening up the economy. So you just uh, kindly uh, bear with us, but obviously opening the economy in a slow way is the, is the way to go. So uh, thank you for, for all your support. Uh, to the country and also to the effort of IETF and all your cooperation. So we hope that we can continue to get your suggestions and inputs uh, so that we can consider them in our IETF discussions. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, salamat po. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Have a great day to everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.